You can also get polarization effects due to scattering. Now, scattering is a very fundamental optical process. If you have an electromagnetic plane wave moving through space, if it experiences any um, variation in the refractive index with position, it'll scatter at some level. So you can often see it drawn very schematically. Plane wave, object, and then you get scattering. It sounds fairly simple, but it's actually extremely difficult to calculate. It gets complicated very, very fast. So let's look at a simple case, the simplest case we can of electromagnetic scattering. So let's see, we're going to think about a little particle. Let's pretend it's glass, a little piece of glass. And we're going to have a plane wave come along at some k vector like that. So we know the k vector, so we know the wavelength, we know the frequency, we know the direction. We actually aren't going to worry about magnitudes much, but I'll just say it's E naught, some oscillating electric field, even though we don't care that much about the magnitude. We're really thinking about the polarization and uh, the direction of the light and the wavelengths of the light that scatters. Okay, so there we go. That's going to hit. So what that's going to do is polarize this little glass sphere, and the polarization it gives it is going to kind of oscillate. It's going to polarize it up and down, up and down. So the glass, so the, I'll just say the particle has an oscillating polarization. Or we could say it has a dipole moment. Uh, P equals some magnitude of its dipole moment cosine omega t. Oops. And we can give it a direction k hat if we wanted to. Doesn't really matter. So electrons are moving up and down. A dipole moment is oscillating up, down, up, down. Okay. So to calculate this polar, the uh, the amount of scattering. We need to give it a well-defined coordinate system, and we're actually going to go to spherical coordinates. Okay, it's important to do this in spherical coordinates. So if we want to say this is the polar axis, you can come pick any point out in space. There it is. And you're at distance r as you go out, as spherical coordinates. Um, and uh, it's the angle theta from the polar axis. And if I said, I think I said polar, I meant to say spherical. If you go down in this plane, then you're at distance uh, phi away. So you got your polar angle, your azimuthal angle, and your radius. Okay. The next thing you do is lots of E and M would fill many, many boards to calculate the electromagnetic field that comes off this. And we're not even really thinking about the internal, the incident plane wave anymore. All we said for the incident plane wave is it sets up this oscillation. We're really calculating the dipole radiation pattern here. And what does dipole radiation um, look like? So if you really did it, you would get that the pointing vector uh, looks something like this. has a lot of terms. Um, the dipole moment squared, oops, omega to the fourth over 32 or 12, 32 pi squared, r squared, um, epsilon naught, C cubed, the speed of light cubed. And then, unless I left something out, it's got a sine squared theta. And it's in the r hat direction. That is the pointing vector. That is the power per unit area of light that would come off the sphere. And we can see what aspects of it make sense. Well. It makes sense it goes down as 1 over r squared. Most point sources of energy go down as 1 over r squared. You'll find that if you move out to a bigger radius, the surface area goes up as r squared. So those two cancel, and that's why you have conservation of energy in this case. So it has to go down as 1 over r squared. You'll also notice that it's got a sine squared theta uh, in here for the polar angle. And that's what tells you that the dipole only radiates perpendicular to the, to the, uh, to the oscillation. It doesn't uh, radiate along the direction of oscillation. So if we say um, theta, for instance, equals 0 degrees, then that would be straight up and sine of theta is 0. So it would be 0. And if theta equals 90 degrees, 
right along this original direction of the um, incident wave, then is going to be maximum. But then there's no azimuthal dependence, no phi dependence. So what you can see there is that the plane wave came in this way, and you get just as much light coming out that way and going into the board as you do straight ahead, and just as much light coming right back. In this simple approximation, all we really care about is the, is the polar angle. Okay? So you get one way to draw it is you kind of just draw it as a lobe, right? So if you have, if we wanted to go back to this drawing, and say, what is this going to do? A plane wave approaches a small particle. You get kind of some radiation going out that way and some coming out this way, and it comes towards you and it goes behind you. So you get sort of a donut of radiation, right? None this way, perpendicular to the K vector, but plenty in all these other directions and none down. So that's the direction that the light scatters. You can also see the uh, wavelength dependence is here. So it goes as 1 over the wavelength to the fourth, right? Because this is omega, and that's sort of the temporal frequency. We know we could write omega is ck, so we could call it c to the fourth over uh, times k to the fourth, but k is 2 pi over lambda. So we could write a bunch of stuff and get it to be 1 over lambda to the fourth. So this sound of kind of scattering is uh, very strong in the blue. So if we're going to plot versus wavelength for visible numbers, wavelength, lambda, in nanometers, and we're plotting like this, 1 over lambda to the fourth. And the lambda changes by almost a factor of 2. So it's a really big difference, a factor of 2, about 16, between 400 and 700 nanometers. So this kind of scattering tends to look blue.